Welcome everybody to episode one of our bonus episodes featuring the wonderful talents of Lisa Namikis, Christopher Gilson, Crescentio Jackson, and our leader, Amelia Brister. Welcome to this bonus podcast. Today we're going to talk about best practices using OER and materials in the classroom. And first though, we want to start off by introducing exactly what it is that we're after with this project. And so I'm going to throw it to Amelia. Amelia, can you give us a little history of how this project came to be and uh, what we're actually trying to accomplish? So this podcast is created through a grant that myself and Emily Frank worked on. Uh, Emily Frank is one of our partners with Lewis, which is our consortium here in Louisiana. And the Louisiana Board of Regents e-learning innovation grants program were looking for projects and submissions to their grant. And we submitted Learn with Podcasts, creating podcast lectures to enhance dual enrollment students' engagement with history to be embedded into the world history course that Lisa and Chris and I worked on together. So that's kind of the history of why we started um, putting these podcasts together. And from my experience, it's been a lot of fun. I hope the others can say the same. Speaking of that, we do want to introduce the guests. Professor Namikis, please tell us a little bit about yourself and what college you represent. So my name is Lisa Namikis. I have been, oh gosh, and is teaching for, say, 15, over 15 years now. Um, most of those years in Louisiana, uh, starting out as an adjunct and then finding my home at Baton Rouge Community College. Uh, I will work and read primarily in, you know, Post Cold War or post um, World War II history. Um, I love writing about Africa and I love teaching world history. Excellent. And to Miss Brister's question, how fun has it been for you to work on this project? Well, this project has been a lot of fun. Uh, you know, the podcasting is something that I never dreamed I would be doing so quickly after <laughs> you know working on the textbook, but it just fits in so well. I'm so thrilled with it. I think it's going to enhance the course beyond. Uh, beyond measure. Just having that audio connection with the students, it's, it's exciting. Professor Gilson, please introduce yourself and tell us your thoughts on the project. My name is Dr. Chris Gilson. I'm an associate professor of history at Northwestern State University in Louisiana. And I've been teaching for NSU for about eight years now. And um, my main area of um, interest, research, and reading is late medieval history, um, Renaissance history, early modern history, um, colonial period. So this class fits in really nicely with the material that I work on in research as well as um, what I'm interested in teaching and what I do teach. Excellent. Professor Jackson, same question. Who are you and what has your experience been thus far with this project? Like he said, my name is Crescencio Jackson. I am an instructor of history here at Louisiana Delta, and I also started as an adjunct with many of the schools here in the state of Louisiana. I worked at Grambling State University and I eventually got a full-time position here at Louisiana Delta Community College. And now I'm also the division chair of liberal arts. So I've been pretty much all over the place in that. Also, since I have been an adjunct and been all over the place. I've talked just about all of the histories that are offered at most of the uh, community colleges here in the state of Louisiana. So I have taught uh, American history. I've taught Louisiana history. I've also taught uh, world history, Western civilization, one and two. And so I'm pretty much all over the place. I wish I could kind of focus. And we are such a small school. So uh, I'm only one of, of two uh, history instructors here. It kind of prevents me from really focusing on one particular area. But I also did the OER for Lewis Libraries for the American History, American History One. And so I love that experience. And so when Amelia Brister came on, came and asked me about getting on board with the podcast, I was just elated. I thought this is what we need to do just to keep it going. I'm a big fan of OERs and I hope that we could really hopefully use them more in the state of Louisiana because they do save uh, the students quite a bit of money and I know it's great having access on first day of class to be able to go ahead and start reading and lecturing and doing the assignments we need to do versus waiting till everyone purchases a book maybe two three four weeks later so I love the OE, OER projects and I hope we can hopefully get this to be something that we can really spread throughout the state even more. 
Thank you so much, all of you professors. And Ms. Brister, we're going to throw it back to you because the first question out of the gate was, what is this project about? But you didn't get a chance to introduce yourself. As you introduce yourself, though, tell us exactly what are OER materials? Well, uh, my name is Amelia Brister. Um, I work at Louisiana Delta Community College as the Director of Library and Learning Resources. And as I stated before, you know, I got into the OER world through the Lewis Library um, Consortia, which connects all of our academic libraries across the state of Louisiana. Um, and so their focus was OER materials and OER materials are freely and publicly available teaching, learning and resource research resources um, that reside in a public domain or have been released under intellectual property license that permit their free use and repurposing by others. Um, it can be a textbook, course material or a full course with modules, uh, streaming videos, tests, software or other tools. Um, but the great thing about these materials is that they are free and as Chris Sancho indicated, they are available to students day one of the class, which was one of the focuses of our Lewis project. We were trying to address the DFW rates in the state for our dual enrollment courses. So we feel like this podcast is actually going to address um, some of that retention that that we're trying to accomplish. So that's interesting. You talk about retention, and it sounds like we're getting towards an accessibility question. So who is the best audience for OER materials? Well, I'm going to kind of lean on what I know. Um, I would say the best audience would be instructors and students who don't want to spend a lot of money on textbooks and want to make it available to their students day one of class. However, I'm going to throw this question over to one of our instructors uh, who worked on the project because they are in the classroom and they'll have a lot more information for us. I think um, the best audience for OER materials are um, students who are comfortable working with technology which a lot of our, our students obviously are today, and students who are looking for multiple ways to access their course materials. There's a lot of conversation today about mobile first design and the fact that students are accessing our courses from, uh, from their phones, from tablets, from laptops, from traditional desktop computers. We don't really know um, going into a classroom what our students are using uh, to connect with us. So. OER materials, uh, because of the purposeful way that they're designed, um, are intended to be accessible in a variety of different ways. And so I think um, that's a, a core audience um, uh, for these materials. And then just in general, students, I, I would agree, that are, are looking to save money on their course materials. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that in, in another episode, I think, but it's it's really um, amazing to see how much money can be saved for the for, by using these materials, and um, I think that's uh, an important consideration. You know, that's just kind of what you know I said in my introduction. You know, just being able to have instructional material on the first day is just a great asset. You know, you're not waiting and waiting for that student to say. And then also for the instructor side. The student doesn't have that excuse. Well, I, I wasn't able to get my textbook, so I can't do this quiz. So it really takes out a lot of barriers during the first weeks of class. And I know I've even experienced, and I know others here in our, our cohort have probably experienced, you know, some students just aren't going to buy the book the entire semester. So they can have, they won't use that excuse for the entire semester. And, you know, at some point you're like, well, we have to give up on that one. But you just, that takes out so many excuses of our students and why they can't really participate in class and do the things that are needed. So the only thing they can really say is that they didn't read the material because they have I was going to say, too, that, you know, uh, we were talking about the best audience for OER. I think once OERs become more established, like Chris said, once they become, you know, technologically, you know, sound and word gets out, I think what's going to be really exciting are the new students that we can draw 
into campus that you know potentially just wouldn't even consider college because they know they can't access material or they're just you know they're not able to afford it but it's those students that we're going to reach beyond you know just who's sitting in our classroom right now um you know where this course can go you know even worldwide is just some you know something i think that you know in the future it'll change and, and i'll kind of like to see that greater access um for for everybody now, piggybacking off of those answers, how can instructors and course adopters ensure quality materials? In other words, what are some best practices in choosing OER materials or textbooks for a course? Now, I'm shamelessly going to plug the value of librarians in this area because as librarians, we can help instructors find materials that are open or have those Creative Commons licenses and or quality. But I really, um, that was my shameless plug. So I'm going to throw this back to the instructors um, since they work with the intended audience for these materials and they have a better understanding of the actual materials for their for their courses. Uh, Lisa, would you like to answer Ron's actual question? Sure. So there was really two parts to the question, right? One, how can we ensure quality materials and then best practices in choosing the materials? So I'd like to comment on uh, just choosing the quality materials because I think that's something that you know I've noticed evolve you know, a lot over the past five even ten years you know I got involved in creating online classes uh, you know ten over ten years ago and just the materials available were so slim you know that when OER started coming out it was almost like there was just one to choose from or two to choose from and these days, the whole idea of revising OERs has really taken root and I think has helped ensure the quality because unlike a published book, you can revise an OER almost instantly, you know, or, you know, at least it's it's there, uh, you know, for revising, whereas a print version through a publisher would take, you know, potentially two or three years and a whole lot more money involved and another whole printing. Um, so in this sense, Revising what we have and keep continuing to revise and revise, I think it's producing some materials <clears throat> that really show some great quality and we have choice now. I think that was really one of the um, purposes of this project and then the project that this developed out of the original textbook project, because this is locally organized and locally assembled. It's built by faculty at institutions in Louisiana, edited by faculty at institutions in Louisiana who reviewed all of the major available OER materials and selected a, a starting point that um, that we thought was appropriate. We looked at what was out there and chose a point to start at and then made decisions about what to, to change or to improve before releasing it to for pilot purposes this year and ultimately for uh, public use uh, in the future. That really was the point of this, was to uh, provide a, a local connection to these materials. So you're not just signing onto a website and hoping that someone in some other state has produced something that's useful, that's appropriate, um, that is complete. Uh, these are people that are in, in your own institutions in many cases, uh, in your own towns that have looked at this and have, have built a course around this and who are using it that you can contact and say, how is this working for you? What have you done um, to improve upon this? Uh, what have you? Uh, what are your thoughts about using this? So that local connection, I think, um, helps ensure quality in a way that um, a nameless, faceless website m may not be able to. OER materials are free, but they tend to be tethered to accessibility via online resources, and not everybody has access to the internet. Is there a way to overcome or how do we overcome that barrier so that we can truly say that our OER materials are absolutely available and free to the general public and everybody who is interested? I think uh, it's, it's really, in, in many cases, it's going to come down to the librarians at each institution to help facilitate um, that kind of access. Everything that, um, that we've built, um, there is a way to publish it to PDF that can be saved onto a hard drive, um, whether it's uh, textual or whether it's audio, uh, whatever uh, we've built as a part of this process, um, we can 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 make that work. But it, in many cases, it's going to take some communication with uh, libraries and with the Lewis Consortium to ensure 
uh, that that can be done um, and that it can be accessed. Yes, that that is correct. We we were very intentional on about making sure that everything could be published to a PDF and then um, making sure that students have, you know, at our institution, they have flash drives available at the counter so that we can uh, load their resources onto their flash drive and and basically have the textbook with them and not be dependent on Internet, which in our area is very spotty. Thank you so much. Now, it has been said things can be good, fast or cheap, but never can something be good, fast and cheap. Why do you think OER materials can transcend this generality? Well, I'll circle back to what Lisa said earlier. Um, although it, it does take a long time for like a group like ours to remix or completely create OER materials, it's only a fraction of the amount of time that it takes for a publishing company to put this that type of material out to students. And we all know the publishing companies make a healthy profit from that. So I do think that in that way, and because these materials are peer reviewed on several levels, um, we peer reviewed each other's work before we actually put it into the course. And then we had others across the state, other instructors across the state peer review the materials before they were put out to students. Um, so that gives you the quality fast um, in the amount of time that we put these out. I think we worked on the whole project for a year and a half, but the actual writing part took a year. Um, and then, you know, they're free. So I do think that meets all of those elements. I think it's important to, to remember that while it, it may be um, cheap for students, uh, there were costs at multiple other points down the line. And so it's, it's maybe just a, I don't know, redistributing those costs to, at different places along the the development path uh, from the original sources that we use from several different institutions and OER providers um, a, an awful lot of work had gone into to writing those materials before we ever started remixing editing um, um, and, and utilizing those materials and then for us um, it you know was time consuming for us and for our institutions that um, encouraged us to participate in this and um, the state agencies that were responsible for uh, setting up the or applying for the federal grants and then using state monies as, as appropriate and, and so forth to uh, to make this happen. So there are multiple points at which that that cost has been paid along the way. It's just not the student at, as the end user that's that's paying that price. And I think that's that's good for the state. I think that's good for our institutions and good for the future. But it is important to remember that uh, it was it was by no means cheap or free to uh, the people working on it, even before we ever were involved in the process. I would argue the most valuable question throughout this entire episode, this bonus episode, would boil down to something like this. From an instructor's standpoint, if an instructor is thinking about using the materials that have been created, what do you want those instructors to understand about how to best use the podcast episodes in their courses? And or consequently, what advice would you give the instructors in using the course? Well, I think the podcasts really are a wonderful supplement to the textbook because they allow you to focus on a particular dimension that perhaps you know you have a particular interest in or you can you have access to and you can just kind of highlight something you know in depth interesting for the student to kind of chew on a little bit more perhaps than just reading you know the textbook week after week after week so they really allow you know some engagement the student can listen it's a different format and you know, that's also you know appreciated for students to, you know, they, I think they like having different formats in classes, just one all the time really gets repetitive. So the podcast can be an engaging way to, you know, draw a student in, get them to focus on perhaps, you know, a person or an event in a way that they might not have thought about before, and then leave them with some questions. Um, and there's also that human dimension to it too. You know, you're talking to the student and, you know, you're, you're there with them uh, as the podcast is playing. So they, you know, I think they appreciate that um, 
as well. And also, you know, when I'm creating my podcast, at least personally, one thing I did try to do, and as Chris mentioned, this is we're trying to bring out the local connections that we have in our world history class. And so I really tried to find a local connection to what I was talking about. So I was able to do that in, in many instances. Um, and so I thought that just highlights where the student perhaps can go after the class is finished and continue to explore the world, even here in Louisiana. You know, they don't have to, you know, I guess just believe that they're they're isolated from the rest of the world. If they look around them, there's all sorts of connections to to the global world um, that they could reach out to. And that's kind of what my same thinking is as well, is that especially most of our students, you know, we will always assign them chapters to read, but, you know, it's often, as I've been stating all along, a struggle to really get them to go ahead and read it. So hopefully the podcast will kind of maybe entice them to read and, you know, it's, it's a, and give them an engaging experience and say, well, maybe I should read that chapter that my instructor assigned me to, to read. You know, I've heard so many great details and tidbits for the podcast. And this might be something I really could enjoy. So that is what I'm hoping that I can use in my class and then hopefully we'll, we'll see it being used throughout the state is that we see this person locally in a podcast that is probably maybe even your instructor uh, might need to uh, go ahead and read these chapters and that may help the learning experience within that class for that semester. Everyone needs variety um, and students need reinforcement from um, different types of materials for different um, approaches to learning and just for as you were saying as kind of an introduction into to the textbook sometimes it to get people interested in reading something they need a window into it that um, maybe is in a different format I know reading my course evaluations from just from this last semester uh, one of the regular comments that I saw was how much people appreciated the um, whatever YouTube videos or supplemental audio or visual materials that I was including that I included because they were relatively close to what I was talking about for that subject matter, um, not because they were necessarily perfect for it, but the students loved it. And I think what's really exciting about this is that this is a, a an audio material. These are podcasts that are intended to go with the textbook. And so I'm hopeful that um, we'll see that same kind of enthusiasm um, returned in the future. Absolutely. Chris, this one is going to come back your way. It's fitting that you answered that last question. We all know that as instructors, when implementing any new teaching resource or technology or what have you, trouble may brew. And we heard that you had some struggles importing the course into your LMS. Can you tell us about what that experience was like and how you overcame it? Definitely, um, uh, definitely overcame it. I've taught this material in, uh, I've used these OER materials in five sections over two semesters now. Um, and obviously the second semester, there really weren't any challenges. The challenge is always the first semester implementing something new. Um, and in this case, what, what really happened is that different institutions have different learning management systems. And even if they have the same learning management system, they might have a different version or iteration or release of that system. And so some of the, the materials, uh, when I went to import them into my version of Moodle, which was an older version of Moodle than the one that the materials were developed in, uh, at least for the entire course as one unified um, file, one unified uh, download. Um, it didn't uh, upload perfectly into my learning management system. Everything was there. The images were there. The documents were there. The text was there. The instructions were there. Everything was there except for some of the, the questions in the te test bank. And so um, what I ended up having to do was um, take the uh, what I ended up having to do was export the, the test questions, the test bank as a separate file, um, and then upload those directly into the course shell and um, replace those. Now, I've, uh, I've talked to Lewis about that, um, and I think they're, they're working on finding solutions for that. So hopefully that won't be an, an issue for the future. But if it is, it's, it's really just a matter of um, having uh, Lewis send out 
or make available the test banks as a separate download to be um, to be uploaded into into the course and, and building your test or your quizzes from there. Thank you so much. As we wrap up bonus episode number one, are there any closing thoughts before we adjourn? I think one of my closing thoughts is that, you know, I want all instructors and even, I guess, even students that may encounter this podcast and want to use it, you know, not to be afraid of OERs. I think it is a great opportunity for us in the state, you know, especially, you know, we often talk about the state of Louisiana and we don't have this and don't have that. One of the things that, you know, most of our students K through 12 have had have has been free textbooks. So we always see that little, you know, thing when they get to the college setting like well wait a minute i gotta buy the books and so now we can kind of give them a little bit more of what they've been used to for k through 12 and having a free textbook even though it is electronic with the oer so i really hope that this could be an opportunity for you know instructors professors here in college and university of state of louisiana to embrace it more because you know especially a lot of them uh professors and instructors have been so useful you, you know you go to the bookstore you buy your books but our students aren't. So they're used to K through 12 free books, even they go to private school. And so that has always been a divide between instructors, professors, and their students is that they expect you to have this textbook, but students like, no, I don't want to buy it. I don't I have enough uh, cash, and you know, I'd rather spend it on something else or do cell phone instead. So I think this could be a great tool to take out that, that divide. So I really want professors, instructors, uh, division chairs, deans to really embrace this concept even more. And I hope this opportunity with the podcast really will help that. This podcast episode has been produced under a CC by NCND license. All episodes in this series are made possible through the efforts of Lisa Naminkas, Christopher Gilson, Crescentio Jackson, Ryan Pierce, and Amelia Brister. Thank you for listening.